Hello, I'm Jonathan Douglas. Thanks for joining me for another installment of the Art Smart series. In this episode, I'm going to be focusing on the work of Mark Rothko and how that relates to my work, minimalism, modernism, Buddhism, and many more disparate topics, and we'll meander along Mark Rothko's shoestrings. Marcus Yakovlevich Rothkovitz was born in Devinsk, the Russian Empire, which is present-day Latvia, in the year 1903. As a child, he moved with his family to New York City, where he lived in a uh, very modest lifestyle. His father was a pharmacist and was also an avowed Marxist whom Rothko referred to as being violently anti-religious. So growing up in that environment was very formative on Mark Rothko's early life. So it was a big change when his father Yaakov reverted back to his Orthodox Jewish faith. And this all coincided with the families moving to the United States. So when Mark Rothko's father unexpectedly died and left the family destitute, he had a lot of mixed feelings, with good reason, that were related to his religion, because his father, having just converted and then dying, I think that left Mark Rothko feeling like, you know, the religion was a sort of a waste. Most of his life's work was decidedly atheistic in theme. And I think we can probably conclude a lot about Mark Rothko's worldview from that early childhood or teenage experience with the death of his father and the death of his religion at such a, a crucial time. Rothko followed in his father's footsteps with social activism and union organizing and learned more about class struggle and Marxism. So he received a scholarship to Yale, but he ended up leaving school possibly due to harassment and racism. And after leaving, he worked a few odd jobs. Eventually, in 1923, when he was 20 years old, he found work in the Garment District of New York, where he began his art career in a more formal sense. Like most people, I associate the name Mark Rothko with his monumental, dichromatic, oriental palette uh, paintings, of gray and maroon rectangles with soft edges fading into one another like horizon lines and landscapes. But as with all painters, Rothko did not invent his style overnight and Rather, he was influenced by many factors that forged his life and charted the, the course of his life, as well as his work. So when he was working in New York in the late 20s and early 30s, he was around other artists and he was learning about expressionism and the work of Paul Clay and some of these uh, vanguard of the avant-garde of the abstract movement or abstract exp expressionism, which at that time was still in its nascency. And even abstract painting at that time, very few people were doing non-representational abstraction. And that was not in vogue the way it is today. In the 1930s in the United States, there was no ab abstraction, it was all representational art. And of course, in Germany, 
when the fascists came to power, they were destroying what they called decadent art, which was the nascent abstract impressionist movement, because fascism and nationalism put such a heavy value on idealism. They wanted to put their ideals on a pedestal, and that meant representing not so much realism, but idealism, romanticism. The jazz culture in the United States, I think, may have even influenced. I've not read anything about this, but I, I have to think that Rothko being in New York in the 1930s would have been around jazz music and the Harlem Renaissance, where there was that, there were like the zoot suits, and there's just a lot of you know, art deco minimalism. And I think all of that played into his early career when he was around other artists and learning and developing his style. You may have noticed the canvas behind me. This is one of my recent paintings. It's 24 inches by 24 inches, which is large by my standards, but much smaller than anything that Mark Rothko would have produced. And while Mark Rothko's work was more pure abstraction with no clear representational imagery, most of my work, even what verges on abstraction, has a lot of elements like this sort of looks earthy and then the uh, the spheres and the lines between the spheres there are a lot of images that could be taken to represent something and in my case I often try to conceptualize it as a Jungian mandala so like thinking feeling intuiting and sensing and the motion between these things and I like to experiment with painting on a square and composing on the square where the diagonal is an important thing, and I'll talk more about that in other videos, but um, the important thing to understand is that my paintings, to me, I called this uh, gathering composure, and to me it represents this sort of chaos, cosmos, and order onto chaos, and then the blue and the green, the coolness, calmness, and the balance of these spheres on, you know, this almost looks like a rock. And Mark Rothko's work is much more akin to something like Oriental calligraphy, which has no bearing on representation. It's, you know, pure line, pure color, and those solid bands of color. And I think that while this would be an abstract painting technically, it still has a lot of the hallmarks that would keep it grounded in a more representational framework. This is a, sort of an old-fashioned kind of abstract painting. This would be the sort of thing that Mark Rothko would have done when he first came to New York in like the 30s and 40s. 20s and 30s, I think. By the 40s, I think he was already working on his um, solid square or you know, rectangular, I think they're called, uh, his rectangular paintings. But I wanted to, uh, to show this and discuss it briefly. Rothko's earliest work would definitely be classed as expressionism, but it was very much representational. He did figures in subways and New York cityscapes with people in them. And that style gradually evolved to where he was using more, he was leaning more heavily on color and form and less on the objects that were being depicted until he arrived at a sort of prototype for the work that he would develop later, which were mainly rectangles and these organic shapes without having reference to a tangible object. And I can't help but think that maybe Rothko's connection and association of his teenage experience with the death of his father and the death of his faith that in Orthodox Judaism there's the idea of tohu vavohu, the formless and void chaos which birthed cosmology and in, in a way Jewish halakhic laws are a way to impose that order onto chaos and 
maybe some part of Rothko was reacting against that and trying to embrace the chaos instead of putting a veneer over it. And there's something about his socialist background too that I think would play into that where you're embracing the community and embracing the idea that we all have to work together and not rely too much on this idea of you know competition and order eventually after he had gotten married and he divorced his wife he went and lived in uh, on the west coast and befriended some you know more pure abstract painters his work gradually began to take on the character for which it was known and ultimately the biggest influence on Rothko seems to have been his study of Nietzsche which Nietzsche is one of the darkest philosophers that I've ever had the misfortune to read and it's Nietzsche was unquestionably a genius but that line between genius and madness may very well have been the same line that Rothko was painting and he wrote about himself as being a myth maker and Nietzsche with Zarathustra was writing this new cosmology this new myth this reaction against conventional religious values and there's a lot that I admire about Nietzsche there's a lot that I admire about Rothko but both of them sort of went off an edge um, wandering in the mists of obscurity and the mystery without religious guidance or you know trying to form this new higher morality I think at least in the case of Nietzsche and both of them produced very profound very beautiful work but like Nietzsche Rothko ultimately ended his own existence in a very unfortunate way and you can see in the development of his work the sense of sorrow and depression that seeps in and Rothko continued to drink and smoke cigarettes all of his life which ultimately took a toll on his health both mentally and physically you know caused him to be further alienated and nihilistic and while he did remarry and have children that sorrow possibly at least begun in part after the ending of his first marriage and doubtlessly the death of his father at such an early age played a role all through his life but he traveled to Europe after he began garnering some acclaim for his work in the United States and then he traveled to Europe went to Italy and was really impressed with a series of frescoes in a chapel in Italy that were painted in that deep maroon sort of blood red color that became so prominent in a lot of his work and I would again draw the parallel between religion philosophy nihilism and his choice of continuing in this direction of minimalism and those sort of dreary colors which ultimately you know his his final paintings which were sort of his masterpiece are black on gray and there's a lot that I can commiserate with and relate to in Rothko's paintings like there's always that sense for artists that we're expected to explain our work and for me personally I have never really had the audience to be very expressive so I tend to paint more commercially viable subject matter 
and I go out of my way to paint for the audience rather than painting for the purpose of self-expression. And in that sense, I'm not as much of an artist as I am like an illustrator, whereas Rothko was truly an artist and was really trying to paint for his own fulfillment. And ultimately, he abandoned titling his works at all, um, which is sort of the last stage in abstraction where you go beyond saying, you know, ici n'est pas un pipe, uh, where you, you know, you're, you're saying this is not, you know, this image of a person is not a person, which again, with regards to Rothko's religion, that's a big part of Orthodox Judaism is not representing something to make it an idol. That's part of the Mosaic laws is thou shalt not make any graven image. And so it's very clear in Judaism um, that whenever you're painting something, you know, if you're painting a landscape, it's not a landscape, it's colors and forms that can be seen as a landscape. And so maybe some little part of Rothko's subconscious was playing into that too. Um, and that may have affected his decision to pursue true abstraction so far. And he was really the first, there was, you know, of course, Jackson Pollock, there were a lot of artists at the time doing similar things, but he was the only one to really go out there and paint these massive canvases of just very monotonous, very dreary, oppressive, tomb-like colors. And I think he's had a tremendous impact on art of the present day because Rothko was seeing the beginnings of the societal, if we want to call it a decline, um, but certainly a, a change which politically was no doubt part of his uh, worldview. And we're seeing that today with the advent of the internet, the breakdown of traditional society. And, you know, for Rothko, growing up in the 1920s, he was seeing the fulfillment of the Industrial Revolution where the village life was completely gone. And, you know, his, his father, growing up in that traditional culture, that was all being replaced by the American dream of working, you know, being prompt and um, this nine to five daily grind and the city that never sleeps. And so Rothko was seeing that and then he was chain smoking cigarettes and he was, you know, drinking a lot of alcohol and keeping his mind in the gutter in a sense because the gutter was all he had the gutter was all around him and that nihilism of the spirit which was reflected you know in the water of the gutter and all across the the skyscrapers and all across the the city of New York he was just seeing uh, tragedy everywhere and while you, you had people like um, Norman Rockwell, who I also intend to do a video on, they were painting this idealized America, and even like uh, Edward Hopper, who was painting a, a more realistic and gritty version of America, they were all still painting, you know, a, a real America, and I think Rothko was seeing through all of that, and seeing through the veneer, and seeing through the glitz of uh, New York and seeing the rats in the walls and seeing that beneath everything there was this terrible sorrow and that's what I see when I see his paintings is this hopelessness that ultimately led to him ending his life. Um, As I mentioned in my video about Andy Warhol I often have considered Mark Rothko with a bit of disdain. When I was younger, I saw his paintings, I know people that I respect that like his paintings, 
but there just felt like there was a lot of um, pretension and sort of emperor's new clothes and you know that only intellectuals can appreciate Mark Rothko because he's so profound in this you know Zen minimalism and I've always had sort of a maximalist attitude you know I like um, I like jazz more than I like modern like atmospheric classical music I don't care much for um, I, I forget the composer's name but some of the modernist composers and this very minimalist music. Mark Rothko was always and remains unapproachable to me when he moved into what might be called his black phase, when he started to paint these large black canvases. In my own work I'm beginning to use a lot of muted colors, a lot of grays, and I'm beginning to appreciate that um, when I was younger I painted a lot of um, plein air uh, landscape painting. And when I look at a landscape, I see a lot of this abstraction, a lot of these grays, browns, these mysterious areas, sort of fog. And even if you look at a painting like the great Bob Ross, and you see that misty fog at the bottom of his mountains, to me, that's what Mark Rothko was doing. Mark Rothko's paintings are like the mist at the bottom of the mountains in a Bob Ross landscape they divide the work, you know, and that mystery, there's a lot of liminality which I'll discuss further in these in this video, but Mark Rothko was really trying to distill the mystery of everything in that liminal space, the transmundane, the space between the noumenal and the phenomenal, and a lot of, I think, his angst and depression that occupies that mysterious space between the real and the ideal, and I think that that's what those blurred lines in his paintings represent. I associate Rothko with a bar in a town near me that was, you know, sort of seedy bar, a lot of seedy elements there, and they had Rothko paintings up, and I think it's appropriate, and that juxtaposition of this bleakness in a bleak environment where people feel hopeless and they try to escape with drugs and alcohol um, instead of looking for hope and looking for you know, some higher reason behind everything. And I think Rothko was trying to point to a transcendence. Um, you have a lot of artists like, say, like Charles Bukowski that were also going down that nihilistic path and I think that there is light at the end of that tunnel and that would be Zen Buddhism and there's a lot of similarity between Rothko's work and Oriental calligraphy and I think that he was just a few steps away and I think that was the direction that he was trying to go in and was pointing towards and I think that that's a good goal but at the same time it's a very narrow and very dangerous and very steep road that is not for most of us. And I think that's why maybe it's justifiable that Rothko's work is seen as being elitist. And maybe it is elitist, and maybe that's not a bad thing. But is unquestionably important and Mark Rothko's legacy is doubtlessly very important and while I wouldn't necessarily want a Mark Rothko painting on a t-shirt I think that it's very important that they do remain in museums and textbooks and that we do study his work and not forget it and it definitely plays a role in my own work and I hope that I don't go down that same dark path that he went down, but 
I recognize that that path is there and I try to keep that path sort of uh, parallel to mine uh, keep it on my left shoulder and you know pay respect to Mark Rothko and I call it this Mark Rothko's shoestrings because you know string theory is where we're going now with physics and Mark Rothko was coming of age in the time of Einstein when relativity was new and atomism was new and string theory is where all of that's kind of leading into and it involves the breakup of traditional physics into particle physics and this new physics and that's also the direction that art has gone art has been completely um, broken apart and turned into these black and gray monoliths and i think it's our purpose as artists to try to find meaning in the void and try to have you know the uh, the spirit hovering over the face of the deep um, but yeah mark rothko is uh, very important to me thanks for watching and if you'd like to learn more about painting techniques please consider subscribing on patreon and i appreciate all the support um, if you have any questions leave a comment and make sure to like and share and thanks for watching